Right. Hello, Mark. Um, I'm really happy to have you uh, on the show, mate. It's been a while since we did the, the Morecambe video, but um, I thought we could use this to go into a bit more depth about that. And uh, first of all, how are you, mate? How, how's it going? Yeah, OK. You know, strange times, aren't they? But, you know, we've been keeping busy, um, you know, trying to do everything, you know, slowly, but getting prepared for when we do get going again. And people seem obviously keen to get out there. So hopefully not long. Yeah, I think if I get to the cart track this year, I'll probably start crying. <laughs> <laughs> like you could yeah. put me out in anything, I'd be happy, mate. And um, yeah, it's been it's been been tricky, but it's uh, it's looking good. Um, so, for those that may be new to you, new to what you do, um, would you be able to give us like a brief, um, I guess, history of how you got involved in kart racing, and then obviously we can uh, go into a bit more detail about some of the the aspects to it which are really unique yeah well basically i sort of um you know when i was a, a sort of young lad in my sort of early sort of years like nine and ten had an interest in motorsport although my father didn't he was a motor mechanic but had no interest in racing at all and, and then by chance i uh, happened to get hold of a copy of the karting magazine and went cool this looks this looks good fun um and then realized there was a track i.e. Shennington, not too far away. So I my mum to take me up there, and that was it. That was hooked. You know, I was 1970, um, and I was 13, um, you know, and I was racing in 1971. You know, it was all just – and my dad did buy me a, a small go-kart just to have a bit of a blast around the field that we got the back of the house. So it really started from that, you know, just a passion to drive something fast. And that kind of um... – that kind of that sort of introduction, I guess, for the for the people that are new to you, new to Jade Carts. Um, so you went on to basically manufacture your own carts um, and, yeah. and literally manufacture your own carts. Um, you had mass success, especially in sort of TKM. But you also build carts, build your own cart for Division One Supercar. Yeah, Super one, uh, Division One Supercar. Sorry. And um, but not just that, like you've got a slew of success as a driver and your sons, um, and obviously the association with Danny Curl and his eventual march to the to the world championship. So there's so much to talk about here. Um, but first of all, uh, I think most people will be familiar with you for the video I did on the World Cup. Yeah. Um, so I thought we could use this as a, because obviously that video was short, but this gives us an opportunity to talk about the sort of, that era of karting, because it wasn't just Morecambe. I think we spoke about various other circuits that were on the calendar back then. I mean, um, Plymouth and, and even Aintree, like you mentioned. Yeah. Right. I mean, what? yes. I mean, the Morecambe thing was, that was a good interview, wasn't it? And that yeah, people were really very interested in it. And then a lot of footage actually came up on YouTube, didn't it? From like Leonard Bolin that uh, obviously won the World Cup event there. Um, but yeah, it was it was different in those days. I mean, you go to uh, effectively a club race at Shennington, like when I first went into the gearbox after one year of juniors. Uh, and it was not uncommon to have a C final in the Villiers class. Um, you know, and if you made the B final, you were doing well. And that's kind of interesting. You mentioned the Villiers class because that kind of like <laughs> that's been a backbone of karting for like literally like fifty years, yeah. and it still exists in this country. It's it's the most oddest thing. Like it's hard to describe to people around the world that there's this like it's essentially was a two hundred cc engine that. Um, Whoever, I think the first person to bolt it on a cart was in like 1946 or something like that. Um, even though there's controversy about who built the first cart, but it's sort of, from your viewpoint, what was it? What was it about that class? Why were you attracted into the gearbox stuff? You know, for the because it was unusual that I guess it wasn't unusual back then for the gearbox kind to be popular, whereas now it's a bit more niche. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, as I said previously, you know, my, my father brought me a, a small car and I had actually a BSA Bantam engine on, like a 175. So I was sort of used to driving a thing around the back garden, which had a gearbox. Um, and then obviously you couldn't do anything other than junior. So I had um, a Barlotti car, which I bought from uh, Mark Steeds, who was, uh, you know, a, a, a world-class 
100cc driver and his father, Brian, used to tune motors uh, for lots of people. Um, basically, Paul Carr was one of his protégés and Paul learned a lot from Brian. Um, so you had no, you know, it was a 100cc or not go racing. So we got a 100cc car, you know, and then started racing it for a year. I always sort of went and watched the gearbox ones go around and thought, you know, to me, uh, you know, that's what I want to do. You know, that's got gears, four wheel brakes, more like a racing car. It's what I've been blasting around the garden in. Um, so I made the swap as soon as I was 16. Um, you know, so I was just probably the youngest driver to do it. So in those days, there was a lot of drivers in the 50s racing, you know, and older. Uh, it was quite unusual for someone of my age to actually start off. Well, not start off, but move to gearbox so quickly. Yeah, and then obviously the scene back then must have been so different because uh, obviously Morecambe, the World Cup. I mean, it's still. I still can't comprehend how you could rock up to that event <laughs> and take anything round there and not like get out of the car and go. Okay, that's a bit, a bit, uh, a bit dangerous. How did you? Was it was it something that was normal for the time, or were you all going there going, "Cool, this is a bit." Phew. Uh, well, of course, I don't think. I mean, that obviously the sort of health and safety thing hadn't really happened much, had it? Look at the Formula One cars and stuff. You know, I mean, they were particularly dangerous, weren't they, in that era? Um, so no, we didn't really think it was, you know, unacceptable. I mean, obviously, yeah, there was more accidents there. But, but there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of people in a small area, small space. So it was just different, different times, wasn't it? I mean, they wouldn't like it now, would they? The old health and safety people, you know, coming down, coming down at ninety mile an hour, you know, a hairpin, and then just lorry tires at the end and a few sleepers. And by sleepers, you you you, you, you got um, spectators there as well. Like I've seen the videos at the hairpin and. All, all the blokes just in wearing short shorts and, and <laughs> yeah. trainers. Yeah. I mean, it was great times. I mean, but Hesketh, who actually um, had that cart circuit, you know, he actually run a shop from there. And he was the instigator of the World Cup. Um, and he basically looked at what was happening in football, you know, and then thought, well, that's a good idea. That seems popular and gets a lot of interest. I'll try and do the same thing with karting. You know, so it wasn't just people from this country. I mean... You know, you get people from America, you know, Denmark, all turning up to Morecambe, which you, know, you can see the point like these days in going to Silverstone, couldn't you? But it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? You have world-class drivers turning up there. They were happy to do it, and the event was such that, a bit like that Las Vegas thing, isn't it? Not a great track, but really well publicised and put people's imagination. I think um, when I went there and did the filming, there was still people there even like people walking their dogs that remembered the event and yeah. um i mean they must have got some strange sort of looks from people when they've said you know oh no, you know there used to be a kart race here and obviously they'd mentioned nigel mansell and that because he yeah. raced there famously and um and you just when you're there there's no indication whatsoever that anything like that had um ever happened i i was actually thinking is this where it was because i wasn't sure exactly where yeah. the circuit was Yes, um, it's but it shows how it. A, that is a weird experience, isn't it? When you're there and it's a, a you know a place that had a massive activity and like a worldwide thing, and you sort of stood there and it's all gone. Uh, so I found that thing really interesting, Alan. You know, and it made me think. You know, there's a lot of other circuits that have come and gone that people have never even heard of. Um, I mean, I've got a very early parting book that Alan Burgess wrote. Um, and I think when it sort of started in the six, well, 59, wasn't it? 59, 60, whoever you want to listen to, but around that era. I mean, and within a year, there was probably over 60 car clubs. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's, it's weird, really. I guess it's the, it was the, what was the backbone, really, why, I guess, sorry. Oddly enough, it was the war effort that, we had so many airfields, I guess, yeah. that ended up. That's probably why we've been so successful in kart racing in motorsport is because of the infrastructure left over from, from the war because a lot of these tracks are just based on old airfields. Yes, you know? correct, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a great starting point, isn't it, to have a huge expanse of tarmac 
rather than a purpose-built circuit. So yeah, you are absolutely right. And and to me, all the really great circuits are the old school circuits in my view, like motor racing tracks, aren't they? I mean, they've got more sort of character to them. Exactly. And um, I guess I get that, that UK circuits are very characterful. <laughs> they definitely are sort of because um, it's, it's built in that way. And I kind of like that's what I like about kart racing is that you can sort of put it anywhere, you know, old airfield, car parks and like, as we're going to discuss, I guess, the long circuit stuff. But do you think going back to Morecambe, is there any lessons there that we could learn today? Because obviously maybe it was a product of its time, but. It still attracted spectators, and I'd, it was hard to describe how much of an event it was in that video because, you know, you had like you had bands and stuff, you know, the, the marching bands and everything. Like, I know, I mean, maybe I don't know if a marching band would work at Cart Masters, but um, <laughs> yeah. but is there is there any lessons there? Do you think like because obviously, I didn't know much about Heskiv. I must I, I have to say I didn't know much of him prior to doing the video, but obviously he was a forceful character. Oh yeah, very. You know, and he got you know he got a vision, hadn't he? He wanted to make karting popular in this country, um, and he succeeded. Because I think, I mean, I don't know that much about him either. But then he went on to sort of take the British two hundred and fifty team racing abroad as well. Because obviously, not only did we have a British team in the hundred cc classes, but also we, you know, we did have a British team in the two hundred and fifty classes. Um, you know, and he was sort of team manager of those events used to take people like Martin Hines and Graham Little and his own son and people like that across and do meetings in Denmark, Sweden, you know, all over. So it was, you know, it seems strange, doesn't it? You know, with all this modern technology and all the sort of internet and everything else can reach millions of people, you know, but at Morecambe, like, could attract a huge following with just a newspaper and a telephone, I guess. I guess it's that sort of... Um the the access of the internet means that everyone else has access as well so you're competing with people more yeah. than you ever have and i think kart racing is um i guess it's finding that point where we could we sort of can we do break through on occasions um and sort of hit the zeitgeist <laughs> unfortunately last year it was luca <laughs> throwing his bumper at paolo at the world championship but on the back of that, and I know this might be see controversial, but at least it demonstrated to me that there is some potential in, in it, you know? Even though everyone looked at the event and how negative it was, it still we still have the potential to break through because people can still look at it and go, oh, that looks kind of interesting. So the potential is still there, I think. For an event, I just I mean, don't think I just don't think that um, we're all guilty of it. I guess exploit it enough. I mean, yeah, you're quite right. Back in the day when I was a kid, I mean, there was basically motocross or karting um, and obviously car racing it when you were 17. Yeah, I mean, we've just got to go off in a bit of a new direction, haven't we? Like you've sort of been hinting at and make it more exciting and get people's interest back going. Um, I mean, it is now all focused around being the next Jensen or Lewis, isn't it, really? I mean, all the teams focus you on that. And it's, unfortunately, it's a slight unrealistic goal as well, isn't it, these days? Unless your dad's a multi-billionaire, you don't really stand a huge chance of being paid to drive a racing car, do you? Where, you know, you can compete at a fair level in karting if you're clever enough and keen enough, can't you, on a sensible budget? But we don't actually tell people that, do we? No, not really. And I guess I guess with what you guys do, which I really like, and it's very consistent with everybody I, I talk to, you very fair with your prices. You you haven't got a reputation for charging people the earth. You seem very much uh, based around helping people get into car racing. Well, yeah, I'm always interested in starting people off, you know, and then it's just watching them go around, isn't it, for the first time and then coming in with a smile on the face. You know, that's the buzz, isn't it? You know, you sit them in it, they look a bit sort of nervous and they go off, they come back in, and especially in a gearbox car, isn't it, if you're putting sort of a, I don't know, a slightly older guy in it maybe that's done a little bit of driving around, fancies a go, you know, and they go around sort of in second gear, you know, come back in and think they're doing 200 miles an hour. 
you know, I can't stop talking about it. And the interesting thing was, going back to that book I mentioned, you know, from the 60s, um, there was sort of a bit of this article about, you know, who does, you know, who does gearbox cards, you know, and, they, and then they go on to the fact, well, you know, you get a lot of Formula One drivers come and have a go, like Graham Hill, people like that. And it's interesting when they're doing their Formula One racing, you know, they're very, even in those days, you know, chatting away to this, chatting away to that, not much interrelationship between the two, but they go and have a kart race and they jump out like, you know, oh, I went here, went there, did you see this? And they're a lot more interactive when they're driven a car than they were driving a Formula One. And that's what we need to get back to, isn't it? I think that's sort of touched upon it. I guess we, um, in, in, the, in the pursuit of hyper-professionalisation, and I guess I'm partly responsible for, for pushing that to some degree, the, the, we forget how much more sort of open kart racing is to that kind of culture. Like, because you're so exposed, do you know what I mean? It's... And the way the whole thing works, you get out a cart and you lift it on a stand and you push it back to your... <laughs> like All those little things really are what make karting special. You know, you're not coming into a pits and someone's, you know, having to... You know, it's all a bit of a rigmarole. It's get the thing on the stand, push it in. Everything's very visceral. Yeah, I mean, and the thing for me, you know, obviously I've watched all sorts of forms of racing and not been involved specifically, but know a lot about it. And it always seems a lot of effort to go not very fast, a lot of it, doesn't it? And spend a lot of money. You know, I mean, the car, as you're quite right, you, you know, you can stick it in your van, drive it home, put it in a small shed, can't you? And then go out and compete at quite a high level. You know, any form of racing car now, you need a, a, at least three or four mechanics just to get the thing on the track. You know, where karting is still, even at the top level, is a not an uncomplicated machine is it you know it's quite a simple thing to work on isn't it i think when we look at the um when we look at the top level of the sport um and i, I guess we get lost in these budgets that get thrown about but at the end of the day theoretically you could rock up to the world championship with all you know as long as you've got a half decent motor you can rock up with a car theoretically danny could have rocked up at pf with two carts you know, one in the boot, one on the roof, and a couple of engines. And it wouldn't have made that much difference to the actual performance, you know, the actual logistics well, of it. Yeah, I mean, I think these days, I mean, I think, and it's always been the same, hasn't it? If you're competing at world-class level, I mean, for instance, I mean, that particular year when when Danny won, I mean, the I-Army was the motor to have, wasn't it? Um, and the TM wasn't, um, you know, and there's him and... And Ben Barney coat ran PF, probably the two best drivers, but with Oliver Hodgson, aren't they? Um, you know, and, and Dan, you know, obviously performed exceptionally well on the day. But, you know, for me, you know, the I Army, you know, Chiesa running in with Scott and Ross helping was just a better setup. You know, if he'd have turned up on his own, he'd have still been fast, but you know, there's no way he'd have won. It's just impossible. And I guess, I guess that leads us to. I guess we have to. Well, first of all, I want to talk about um, you. I get you don't do it so much nowadays, but obviously in the nineties and the early sort of noughties, you were building a lot of kart chassis. Like, how did you go from racing carts to deciding I'm going to start building my own car? Like, when did that happen? Why did it happen? Well, uh, and obviously, when when I first started in hundreds, I just bought a car from another competitor. Bar, it was a Barlotti car, um, which I quite liked. So then, when I when I changed to my gearbox racing, I went and bought a, a Barlotti Class Four car. Um, and there was a company in Birmingham called Bill and Ken, the Cart Men, um, and they worked underneath the arches, you know, under railway arches. Uh, so I went down there with 157 pounds and seven and six or something, you know, bought my first gearbox rolling chassis, brand new, uh, and stuck an engine on, which I'd, me and my dad had sort of put together, you know, and uh, went racing with it. Um, and then there was another company um, that I that Nigel Mansell raced for, Dale Carts of Birmingham. Um, and I thought, well, I, I quite like that because they'd sort of put disc brakes on the cart. Um, and I thought, well, that's going to be better than having drum brakes. Um, so I sort of saved up, you know, traded the one and then bought this Dale cart and raced for quite some years with Dale carts. Uh, and today I'm still friendly with the son of the founder of Dale carts, Andy Wharton, that raced himself. Um, and then we did a bit 
you know, with Dino carts, um, Landcourt Racing that replated all the cylinders, started importing these carts with the help of Keith Bisp, a lifelong friend of mine. Um, so we started using that, doing the world champs with it and European champs in the super carts and selling them as well through the business. Um, and then we, they sent us another cart over to try, I think 89 or something. Uh, and it seemed quite good. And we sent it back with about 20 modifications that we thought would be, you know, make it a real good piece of kit. And they just weren't interested. You know, it, that's how you're going to get it. And that's it. If you don't like it, you, you know, don't bother. So Keith and I decided to have a go at making our own. Um, and Jack Barlow from Barlotti that Keith used to know really well, helped us make the first jig. Um, and we sort of put one together ourselves, you know, welded it all together, went to Shennington and I won on the first time out. And it sort of carried on from there then. At least we were in control of our own destiny then. Yeah, if it was no good, we just sort of made another one. And I guess that speaks to something. Obviously, there's not so much of that nowadays as we veer towards, you know, the Italian dominance of the chassis market. Like, when you were developing the chassis, like, how hard was it to get it all together? Like, I, I've dabbled in it myself and I ran out of money, basically. But, like, how did you build up the skills to do it were you already brazen did you already have the knowledge that like because all the stuff like tube bending and jig building you, you you sort of take it for granted but all of those are quite laborious processes to get right they are but i mean in a way i mean like um you, you tend to sort of pinch ideas off other you look at other carts how they're put together how they made and you know what sort of works, i.e. wheelbase, caster camber angles and stuff. You know, so you tend to sort of use that as a base. You know, like you get something that, you know, really works well on the front end. You get a chassis, you know, you bolt it on a flat pay and then make up jigs to sort of get the geometry right. So it's basically just sort of looking at people, how they've done it, and then trying to put all the elements together that you think are going to work. Um, so none of ours was done by sort of, you know, technical drawings and all this sort of thing. It was just, hmm, I think we'll make that. And then, you know, because I could drive pretty well, like we'll go and see if it's any good, you know. And if it's not as good as a Zip or a Barlotti or whatever, you know, we'll have to go back and do some more work on it. So it was just trial and error with us. I mean, I could braze because obviously back in those days, you know, when we had a car garage, you used to have to weld up the cars for the MOT because they all fell to bits after about five years. You know, so I got those skills and Keith was always hands on. You know, he ran um, an engine reconditioning place. So, you know, he's got quite a lot of skills. So we had some good skills between us. I guess I guess my bias is I'd love to see sort of some young drivers. And there are a couple now, I think, that are looking at it like, giving it a go because I, I, I don't think people realize how um th they don't realize the opportunities there i guess one thing that i um came across was a lot of people thought that you needed to have a homologated chassis to race in the uk and you don't <laughs> you, as long as you build to the regulations you, you've got no issue right and i think that's yeah. quite a cool thing to promote um because i think that's something quite unique about kart racing that you can literally build your own chassis and it isn't technically that difficult it's just a bit of a logistical thing like the tube bender you might you need you need a decent one but you don't necessarily need one you need to notch and learn all that but it's not that difficult once you've acquired all of the stuff you need like what, what do you think about that because i know obviously now you've your business is moving more towards important burials and that kind of stuff you've, Obviously, the market in terms of selling carts is more difficult. But as a as a as an exercise in kind of motorsport, you know, is there any way that we can encourage people to maybe try some things themselves? Well, I think maybe um, yeah, you know, the Brexit thing and that it might sort of open up the manufacturing industry in this country a little bit more. Obviously, it's a bit new yet. We don't know what sort of costs we're all going to incur. Do we importing stuff? Um, so it's possible. And obviously, you know, in, in the past, there's been some mega successful companies in this country, and not You know, Tim Gillard, Simon Wright, you know, Zipcarts, you know, all very, very good businesses. But, you know, initially sort of 
you know, the Italians kept sending stuff over cheaper than we could make it. Um, and now their quality, their quality went up as well, didn't it? To be fair, you know, sort of 25 years ago, you know, you'd look at it and go, well, it's all right, but we better re-engineer it. You know, now when you get a new Birrell or a new Tony car come over, it is of a good quality. Um, so I think it's going to be quite difficult for us to start manufacturing carts in a, in a big way in this country now. Yeah, it's a shame, but the opportunity to go racing, I guess, did you did you get any more satisfaction winning on your own car versus racing someone else's when you first started? Was there, was it any better or was it purely just like a kind of utilitarian, I need this to win and I'll do whatever it takes? Um, well, no, it wasn't this, I need this to win. Uh, I mean, if I'd have thought I needed a zip to win against my own, our own manufacturer, I'd have gone and got a zip. Um, so it was more satisfactory, isn't it? Making something yourself and beating, you know, like, you know, although the TKM class is a predominantly British class, isn't it? You know, we sort of started off and when we were doing it, um, it was sort of just when they allowed the Italian manufacturers to register a car for TKM, wasn't it? I can't remember exactly the year because it was previous to that, wasn't it? It was British homologated cars only, wasn't it? Um, you know, and when we sort of first started off, you know, I remember going to Kim Bolton and I think there was 15 juniors there and we had one Jade and 14 Tony cards, you know, and when we'd really got the thing sorted out, especially at Shennington, we almost reversed that, you know, which was quite satisfying. Um, it was just unfortunate that, that obviously the other classes didn't really adopt it so well. You know, it was a particularly good class in Rotax uh, you know, it was an excellent cart in KGP, um, but we hardly ever sold one. Yeah. They were all, everybody thought they needed a Tony cart. Yeah, I guess that speaks to the psychology of it, really. Um, I think it's hard to say, really, but there, there is, I, I, I'm not, I, I sign up to the notion that OTK build brilliant carts, but there is a sort of uh, mentality that it's not so much people want to win, it's just they don't want to make the wrong decision. And um, that's why if you've got a market advantage like OTK has, it hasn't got the win factor. It's the factor of everyone else is on it, so I don't have to worry. <laughs> it's the don't have yeah. to worry factor. And um, which is kind of, it's, it's, it's natural. It's natural human instinct. Um, and it sort of varies between classes, like why maybe you did success, you had success in TKM, whereas Rotax or KGP is a bit more of a challenge. But um and I guess that leads on to what we really need to talk about, which is your twin KZ uh, yeah, Division One car. Um, and there's a lot to talk about with supercars, and obviously people know my position on the suit situation. But as a piece of artwork, what you've built there is like astonishing. Like you've, you, it's not your first time you've built a twin KZ for Division One. I, I think you've done it quite a few years ago. Um, what was yeah, it? we did it about we did it about fifteen years ago as well. Why did you um, Why did you go that route? Well, a bit like when we went that route the first time, like down to cost, isn't it? You know, like a bespoke VM motor these days for the Division One class. I think they're round about by the time you sort of got it ready to hit the tracks, about fifteen thousand pounds. You know, where you know a couple of KZs is probably six. You know. Um, so for us, it was a price thing, basically. And I guess because you've still got the expertise and all of the equipment, you can manufacture your own car. Like, well, yeah, correct. Yeah, because obviously, you know, trying to approach someone to make one, you know, I don't think Russell, had, well, Russell is a bit more interested in it now because he's seeing how well ours goes. So I think he's contemplating putting one together now, which is a great it's a great thing and there's another lad um i think he's called is he daniel thompson or someone um he saw as a cadwell you know and he went off and put two you know secondhand tms on a on a car of his uh, an ms i think he's got you know and for for little money he's uh, blasted round on a division one car yeah brilliant and what was the kind of the engineer because i obviously you've got a You've got two KZs, right? So everything's got to be synced and working. What's the sort of engineering, apart from the sort of building the chassis, which I guess 
isn't particularly complicated because it's you need two rails on the left and two rails on the right. What's yeah. the sort of challenges you've found with trying to get them running well? Because obviously they're quick and we, we, we've seen that you, you're fast, but um, I'm guessing there's extra challenges to syncing two gearbox engines. Yeah, I mean, the sort of the, you know, one of the biggest problems, obviously, was getting the gears to select properly and not go out of sync. Um, and that is one issue where you know, you've got to have some sort of some sort of mechanism to actually cope with that. Uh, basically, it's down to getting all the leverage right, getting all the lengths of all the arms and everything right, getting the angles right, um, and then having some sort of little trick to actually, if it does go out of sync, get the thing back in. Um, but obviously, that's only possible the way on, on the gearbox at six or first. Um, but the thing is, when that you, when you've got 100 horsepower, if one engine is in fourth and the other happens to slip into fifth, apart from feeling a slight vibration, you don't actually really notice. And then when you go into sixth, if you if you give it another whack, it will actually sync them back together. Um, it doesn't really go out of sync that often. We thought that would be the biggest issue, you know, getting the gears to actually select properly. But in effect, it was one of the least worrying things. What was the most worrying thing? <laughs> um, getting the weight down. Because obviously you've got two sets of gears, two sets of clutches, you know, and pieces like that. I mean, you know, for, for me, the, yeah, the, the absolute um, answer to it would be to have two like KZ power units separate and then have a gearbox. So you had two KZ power units then a gearbox maybe in, in the back of the rear axle or something. Uh, but obviously, yeah, that's quite be quite a lot of work to do that. We I, haven't got enough time to do that. Because I did look at the regulations myself, and I was um, doing one of my sort of deep dives, and I was trying to look for little loopholes <laughs> to try and think how could you get more performance out of it. And um, and I guess there are some, but as as all the way with these regulations, you don't know till you put them under the the pressure of a protest or or whatever like that. But like, I guess Division One and Super Karting, I guess, though, despite all of your success in sort of short circuit kart racing, it seems like your natural home is the gearbox stuff and long circuit stuff. Um, what is it about long circuit karting? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always got, I, I guess, you know, I, as as a karting family, because it's your two sons as well, and, and your wife and everything, you, you do this as a whole unit, which I think needs to be sort of celebrated as well. What is it about the gearbox stuff that really sort of keeps you hooked? What what makes it so special? Well, I suppose it, it, you know it's an adult sport, really, isn't it? Uh, you know, I mean, the youngest obviously you can get onto a long circuit is sixteen. I mean, when I started, you had to have a road traffic license. You had to be 17 to do a long circuit race. Um, and a lot of the guys you're racing against are sort of passionate about long circuit kart racing. They don't talk about, oh, I'll do this for a couple of years and buy a Formula Ford. In fact, if that's suggested, they laugh because why do you want to go a load slower? Um, they're a bit more, I think, long circuit kart race people are more like um, motorcycle racers. You know, they love to race something fast, you know, um, and it's it's not dangerous. It's just the thrill of it, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, thrill, it's like a motorbike, isn't it? It's a thrill, you know, you get a lot more thrill out of driving a Division One supercar, in my view, than you would driving a GT car. And I, I sort of like, um, I, I was looking at the lap times, and I don't think people really appreciate how fast these supercars are. Mm. Like... You might, I think they run, they, I guess once you reach about 130, 140, like the top end is, is, is it's where the carts aren't at that. I mean, 150 mile an hour is still mega quick. But it, in terms of braking and cornering and acceleration, and overall the lap times are ridiculous. I don't think people appreciate just how quick, especially like a Division 1 car is. Like, then they're, they're, they're not, and, and for the price, like I know you've had a lot of I, I I sort of frequent the forums a little bit and the and I sort of ghost you know I lurk about and read and everyone talks about the cost and I'm like find me anything that comes <laughs> yeah, anywhere near close to a supercar 
for the same money. Because I know people are sinking houses every weekend to race cars that are essentially slower. You know, yeah. it, 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 I just can't really, I mean, I can't comprehend it. I mean, last year, I th- no, the year before last, we did um, Knock Hill and uh, Andy Bird, who won the, uh, won the uh, British Championship Division 1. I mean, he um, beat the outright lap record of anything around Knock Hill. Um, and then at Anglesey, he did it again. Uh, and the previous record was held by Scott Mansell in uh, an ex-Formula 1 Benetton. You know, so yeah, you're quite right, and I think Jack Dex did he not do a comparison of that um, LMP car that he races against his supercar around Donington? I yeah, I think I I did like a like a uh, overlay, I think, um, and it was about the same pace. <laughs> it was it was like I just it, I, I did uh, I think around Zandvoort is it Elkman was about he he would have hold it at the gt3 race you know and um i is it's one of those things that i guess and it's it, it supercar suffers from the same problems all of karting faces it's just penetrating a wider market and supercarts i guess it's got its niche and this year i think division one is sort of picked up as well a few of the few of the other because uh, i know one two fives is struggling a little bit like Again, I, I know I repeat myself and people will be annoyed with it. it. I can't drive a supercar and I won't until I can get an alternative to lever. But how do you see the future for supercar racing in the UK? Because you're heavily embedded in it. Like, I guess you race it, so you're in the bubble of it and I'm the out, on the outside. Um, but what, what challenges do you think there are going forward? You know, is there issues or is it doing well? Because I'm not, I'm not really sure what, what, you know, what's going on with it. Well, of course, you know, it's um, if some people look at it and they go to, to watch, you know, they see sort of a full grid, don't they, going round. But, you know, that full grid is made up of, you know, various different classes, Division 1, you know, 250 National, 454 Stroke and 125. So, you know, for me, obviously, it doesn't look great um, because I'm used to when, you know, when I think when I won the Kart Grand Prix at Silverstone in 91, there was nearly a hundred entries just in my class, you know, and we can't make a, a whole grid of that now. So it does face a few issues. Um, I think, you know, the MUK taking on board the long circuit championship again was a good thing, um, but they haven't quite got it right. You know, they needed to sort of just have one group of, a long circuit, you know, they've got two, obviously, or two, if you've got Northern Ireland, they've got a super karting group. Then you've got Ian Rushforth super car championship and the MUK one. We ought to have just got their heads together and done it as one, you know, and then tried to promote division one as the MUK's, you know, fastest thing in this country. But they're not interested in that, are they? They, they don't really want to see it, I don't think, as that. You know, they prefer to see you know, someone driving a Janetta Junior being, you know, the next greatest driver going, where in fact we've already got great drivers, haven't we? As you quite rightly say. I think that's where we're... Um, I think, yeah, I think the long... So we share this similar kind of... Um, we exist in this weird realm where, you know, I, I think kart drivers are the best drivers overall in pretty much any, any form of motorsport outside of motorbikes. Um, and I, and, you know, I've done, I've co-written a book about the racist brain and all that kind of stuff. And nothing really convinces me otherwise because of the highly competitive nature of it. But, um, super karting, I guess, culturally, it used to be a lot, we, it used to be more tied to the short circuit stuff. And I guess, I guess after the nineties, there was a kind of a split i guess where the short circuit and the long circuit stuff are now two kind of separate entities and in, in, i'm just doing it anecdotally because i remember watching gearboxes as a kid at, um kim bolton or shenton and you did have some of the long circuit boys racing short circuit i don't know maybe i'm incorrect but the chassis were mostly um long circuit chassis in 125 and they, I, even at kim bolton i think there used to be like a formula e race i'm sure there was I used to, I'm yeah, sure there used to be, be like Formula E at short circuit, um, which is now Division One. Um, 
and it seems to have split off into its own realm. And when when you do that, it, it is quite difficult to um, get new people in, if that makes sense. Or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think no. I think you're actually quite right in what you said. I mean, yeah, we did used to have grids of uh, what is effectively Division One going round. I mean, when uh, my wife Leslie ran the Super Four British Championship, I mean, we even Martin Hines and people like that did, uh, and Tim Parrott, who was world champion, did the short circuit, which was like Kim Bolton, Shennington, Nuts Corner, um, and. But then, of course, quite a lot of the uh, one, two, five started using um, European, you know, Birrells and Tony carts and stuff. And obviously, they weren't. It means you had to have two carts then, didn't it? If you want to do a long circuit, you needed an F1 or a Jade or something, and you needed a short circuit cart. So that effectively sort of stopped quite a few doing. They couldn't afford to do both. Mm. And I guess that's where there was a big shift, wasn't there, when KZ yeah. and. And, and sort of that started dominating the short circuit stuff. There was a detachment, um, but it, it, it there is. It, I do feel like um, there is, and I, I believe this with with all of most books. We spoke about Morecambe, and there was other races like that at the time. And I look at the long circuit stuff, and I do feel like there's a lot of potential there. Like um, I think I discussed yesterday in the, in our sort of conversation before this, how like your project. I'm not. I don't even know if you realise it. But a twin, you've built a two-stroke. You've built a two-stroke racing machine that is faster than a supercar. And it's two-stroke, you know. And I just think, that's... It, I don't know if you realise how cool that is. Like, in the realms of, like, motorsport. And obviously, we've, we, 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 we're going headfirst into this like monotony of single main racing and the depression that that causes upon me because <laughs> I like engineering right so you're building your own car and um I mean do you realize how cool that is like it, it, or, or, or like it or is it just something you do well it's not you you know it's not unique first of all Alan I mean um going back I mean there's my other friend Boyd Barrington that's a very successful driver. Um, and he always raced a cart made actually by Ian Rushforth, who made, he's still now at 74, is making his own supercar for his grandson to race. Um, and he had two pervases on his. Um, but Boyd obviously was quite a heavy lad. Um, but he was still pretty competitive on that. Going back further, um, Derek Price came out with two PNR, if you like, Honda engines in the early 80s, came out and thrashed everybody at Cadwell. Um, and then Martin managed to get it sort of um, deemed illegal. Um, and before that, Stuart Zamelli showed me something of aero carts had got two um, rotary valve air cooled road taxis on at some point, although I never saw that. So it's not. It's not actually uh, unheard of. And obviously, back in the day, in the 60s, there was a class called Class 2, which I think you're building, a sort of replica-type, modern-day Class 2 version, aren't you? Yeah, I guess, yeah, we are building... Try, well, the whole situation made the, the, the completed that project very difficult. It's, Hopefully, this summer, we can start getting back to it. But I guess it's not so much that the, the concept is new. I mean that the thing that you do is seriously like cool i can't think of another word gnarly <laughs> whatever like gnarly would be a, a, because i think i feel like i look at it and i go for example like red bull motorsport have a youtube channel right and um they'll get they'll do something so always like, it, it sort of covers all their motorsport operations you know they're cool videos so like the supercross video They'll, they'll do like a highlights package of their riders and that'll get like a few hundred thousand views. You know, yeah. Marquez might get a few hundred thousand views and then they'll do something else and it gets 7,000 views. And then they do a rebuild of a CR500, right? Motocross bike, which was the legendary bike from the 80s and 90s and, and that. Two million views. Yeah. And then I look at what you do and I go, more the, the, the first for two-stroke and... I don't think people realise that 
sort of, I guess, Division One karting and, and that kind of stuff. You're at the forefront still of two-stroke technology. It's not like it's historic. So it's got everything. You've got these high revving two strokes. You've you've built it like a twin. It's got a hundred horsepower there or thereabouts. Like I'm not talking about sort of whether it's a new concept, but it's like the you're at the forefront of the concept, if that makes sense. And um, I just hope people maybe this year we can figure out a way to expose it to the to the wider world because, like I said, I don't think people realise how cool what you do is um i'm not really asking a question i'm just saying it's just really cool <laughs> and more people should see what you do and i know you're not the only people that build chassis there's other people as well but i guess for me you're culturally you're putting yourself out there if that makes sense so it's, it's very engaging um and i guess i guess um we can't not talk about 250 national um which i guess is another weird caveat because obviously I tested the 250 with you at Shennington. Um, yeah. And obviously at Forest Edge, they've sort of got a grid together. It seems to be that given the right people, it can do quite well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's down to, in, you know, people are pushing it and being passionate about it, isn't it? I mean, obviously Martin Hines, you know, um, he was a very, very good driver. Um and he wanted the sport to be professional, so people got recognised in it. You know, so yeah, some of it he done for his own benefit, didn't he? But you know, people that knock him have totally got it wrong, haven't they? Because he was the one that actually brought it to the attention of more people. You know, managed to talk Silverstone to putting on a, a demo. You know, at the Formula One race. I mean, that's the sort of people we need in the sport and you know graham Payne at uh, forest edge supercar together with uh, a couple of his friends you know people are passionate about 250 kart racing you know with okay some effort but not a huge amount of effort have transformed something from you know four or five turning up you know to i think he's got 54 now actually registered as a number on the forest edge supercar thing you know, and then it just gets self-generating, Alan, doesn't it? People get really keen about it again. And I think the big lesson there for me is, and, and for the sport as a whole, like, um, and I guess if you watch the 250 test uh, that I did, um, which was more like a blog, to be honest with you, but the um, people don't realise that the 250 carts aren't um, standard chassis. So they're, they're effectively... Um, long circuit chassis without without all the bodywork which i find mental or they're a modified short circuit chassis like the hybrid that i drove so it's not like you're you you've got like something that's ubiquitous to promote like normal carting isn't tremendously hard in the sense that you know you can buy a cart and you could find a way to race it these carts are quite um they're not ubiquitous so it's actually quite challenging. So it shows how successful they've been that they've managed to grow the sport, grow 250 National, which is like, uh, for those watching who don't know what 250 National is, it's effectively single cylinder 250 engines um, on long circuit carts raced on short circuits. Like it's a very British thing. Um, so it goes to show that the, the potential is there. And obviously when I drove one, it was very different to a KZ because a KZ is more sort of, you've got to rev the nuts off it. And I think the comment you made to me was like, you've got to use the torque because it is a different yeah. power delivery. Yeah, that's, that's. The, I mean, 250 National obviously became popular, a bit like 210 Villiers in the day, didn't it? Because there was like a huge amount of um, motorcycle engines available for enthusiasts to get hold of at a reasonable cost, bolt it on, um, and away they went. Um, obviously, that sort of started to dry up over the last 10 years with obviously people switching to four stroke uh, from two stroke. Um, but the two stroke thing is coming back, isn't it? You know, with modern technology and uh, emissions and stuff, you know, and obviously there's in the single cylinder category, there's three new manufacturers, small manufacturers, obviously, but you know, nice that's two of them are British, isn't it? With the uh, THR and Viper, you know, actually making a more modern, single cylinder two stroke racing engine so you know there is an opening for it now i mean obviously for them it's a little bit more better for their business isn't there now that there's a lot more interest 
I mean, before they must have been purely doing it for passion, mustn't they? Can you imagine going to the bank manager and saying, I've got an idea here. I'm going to make my own two stroke kart racing engine. Well, how many people do it? Oh, I don't know, probably 50 or 100 in the country. Oh, and you're going to spend like 250,000, 500,000 doing it, you know? So they didn't do it for a money thing, Alan, did they? No, I'm going to have to probably follow up on that because that's another story that's untold, I guess. Like two stroke manufacturers, um, British, is is in itself a, a, a kind of cool story. I hadn't really considered all that much. Um, so that's, that's, but I guess, like, because obviously in 250 National, it's predominantly like the CR250. Which is now quite an old engine, so correct. Yeah, you know it's it's been it's getting di- more difficult to to um, keep the class supplied with parts and these new manufacturers. So I'll have to I'll have to look into that a bit more because that's kind of interesting. yeah. And obviously you've got to move on, haven't you? Or you do end up with you know, bless it, the Villiers class, where it's just you know it's basically you know ought to be sort of put to the sort of historic side now. It was a fantastic class, you know, a lot of good drivers came from that, you know, Nigel Mansell, people like that, raced Villiers cars, long and short, David Leslie, Will Hoy, you know, it was a massive class at the time. But that class was brought about originally in this country because all of a sudden in the sort of 60s, you had sort of Spanish stuff coming in, like uh, Montessas and Bultacos, which were far superior you know, so they sort of split the class, you know, so it was a two, well, it was 200 Villiers and then they had 200 Super. So they actually split it off. Um, and obviously there was a lot more people doing the Villiers class, more affordable. Yeah. And I think, I guess the fact, I, I, I think I'm going to sort of try and get into race one at some point. I, I want to do the 210 challenge. I do because... I don't think people realise how it's so it's so eccentrically British. Do you know? There's, I don't think there's a more British class in the country that we've got. Oh well, no, there isn't. And no, people yeah. don't really know about it because they sort of do the two ten challenge and they turn up and they'll run, you know, off off a club. But I kind of feel like it's a part of, I, I guess, kart racing in this country, and we have our historic groups. We don't. Because we celebrate drivers who leave the sport more than drivers that are successful in the sport, we don't have a tremendous culture for the history of the sport, if that makes sense. So I, I do hope with the 210 stuff, if, if I can get involved in some way. Because it, I even remember when I was doing karting as a cadet in the 90s, looking at 210s, going, what are they? <laughs> and they're yeah. still going. Like, they're still going. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, the thing is as well, like, I mean, uh, yeah, that engine was designed in the 50s. Um, and like um, when we the last year we did um, the Silverstone Grand Prix around the full Grand Prix track, you know, we, which was woodcut, not through that silly chicane they put in for the F1. But obviously we came through woodcut when it was like a proper corner. I mean, do you know what the lap record was for a Villiers round there? No idea. 101 mile an hour average lap pacey then relatively pacey you know that's not bad is it for something that was ancient then and it just uh, even those those stories i love like racing around silverstone and obviously like we haven't even spoke we haven't spoken about so much and obviously i can't i mean i would do this for like hours and hours and hours but like just just before we end like you raced the gp you, you raced in an area where there were spectators at races Correct, and yeah. stuff like that. Like, what was that? What was that whole thing like as a kart driver to, to experience that? I mean, it made you feel like you were a Grand Prix racer. Uh, I mean, Morecambe, I think the one year they had, at, it was a three day event. Uh, I think they had over 25,000 people through the gate because it was some sort of amusement park at the back and but they had to come through and look at it. Um, Silverstone sponsored by Coca-Cola uh, and other things. You got a free ticket to get in, I think, when Coca-Cola sponsored it. You know, and they'd have upwards of six to eight thousand spectators. It always tended to be either the week or week after the British Motorbike Grand Prix or Car Grand Prix. They tend to link all three together. So obviously you had the infrastructure there of the grandstands and stuff. Um, it was just phenomenal. It was completely, you know 
completely different now. I mean, you turn up to Silverson now in a Div 1 for like a even a championship round and there's a few spectators there, isn't there? Even a Formula 3 race doesn't get that many spectators, does it, Alan, these days? No, I think what's happened really with motorsport in general um, is, it, like with anything, um, as time develops, one or two series dominate and they sort of mop up all of the attention. It's like yeah. the Pareto distribution, like a small amount of series now get most of the attention. Like, I don't think F1 has been particularly good for karting, especially senior kart, dry, kart racing. Um, and, I, and I guess in general, you like we've discussed, you know, you had your Martin Hines and your Heskeths, and I think people underestimate the... Because you said there was someone else, I can't remember the name, that did short circuit, I think. People forget, people don't realise the power of individuals who decide, right, I'm going to take this and make it something. Um, and I guess... The, they they show you that the potential is there, um, but nowadays it's very difficult to compete with, because um, you you know you really our competition I guess would be British touring cars and that kind yeah. of thing, um, and I just don't think we've really been able to communicate the sport in a fashion that would be interesting for spectators because we don't do a tremendous job of telling the stories like if I if I if I had my time again for the last decade, I think, you know, the Danny Curl story would be something I'd like to push a bit more. You know, how he went from starting at Shenny to world champion, you know, and give a reason for people to watch. Because if you yeah. give people a reason to watch, because I guess back in the 80s and 70s, there wasn't much else going on. So it was it maybe an easier sell. But I do think the potential there now is if we give people a reason to watch, I think we could, we're not going to compete with, the big forms of motorsport, but we've got something, um, and I think the potential's there because you lived it. <laughs> you know, I you mean, lived I think it. That, you know, I think for me as well. When I did um, the European Championship in '87, I mean, we went uh, when we did um, Hockenheim. I mean, we were there with the Group C sports cars on the same bill. Yeah, so you obviously had, I forget what it was now, 150,000 people watching. And I mean, that was Martin's idea, wasn't it? You know, get the carts going around at Silverstone at the British Kart Grand Prix and let a lot of people see it. I mean, we know what to be with like British superbikes, hadn't we, one round? You said you raced supercarts at Hockenheim. With yeah. 100 and odd thousand spectators. Yeah. You know, that's, and you, you sort of, whoa, 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 we can't just we can't just go over that. That's pretty mad, isn't and it? You, and you sort of, you know, and you sort of wheel the thing out with your mechanic onto the dummy grid in in the sort of well, start and finish. It's still in the same place, isn't it? On the pit, yeah. We come into the amphitheater piece, yeah, and you wheel it out in front of the crowd there, you know. Uh, and it's quite a thing. Sixty carts on the grid, you know. That was the first. Um, the first European, well, the first time I've been out of this country, you know, I turned up there. And we've, when we first went, Keith and I thought it was on the club track. They've got like a 1.6 mile circuit there as well as the 4.2 mile full circuit. And we were scheduled to go on the short circuit, which, OK, that's all right. Cadwell Park length, we know, we know what we're doing there. Then the organisers go, oh, change your plan course of the cameras and that. You're on the 4.2 mile track. Oh, right. OK, that'll be a bit different then. Um so this is news just... to me. This is new. So you raced the full Hockenheim circuit. Without the Senna chicanes or whatever there were before then. It was like, you know, a lot faster than it is now. They've slowed it down a fair bit, haven't they, since the 87. Well, you, you're talking about going through the forest? Yes. Past where Jim Clark, unfortunately. In a supercar? Yeah. With 150,000 spectators? Yeah. And I mean, they were fast then. I mean, you're saying they top out like Elkman when you look at all these onboard videos, they top out at 100, 145. Yeah, you know, the drag of the aero, that's about it, isn't it? You look at all this stuff, about 145. I mean, back in those days, I mean, they would do 160. So, because they uh, had full bodies and not so much drag. So, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight because I need to get this straight. You raced supercarts at Hockenheim on the full circuit doing 160 and over 100,000 spectators. Have, have I got that correct? 
That that's absolutely correct. Mine probably didn't do quite 160. Mine more probably did about 150. But yeah, that's the sort of thing. Yeah. That's the most crazy thing. I I, I heard about people talk. I've, I've I've heard some conversations. Someone mentioned Hockenheim. But where's the footage? I've got to find the footage. <laughs> I've got to find yeah, the footage. Be- I guess there must be some somewhere because say the Group C sports car, it was just like the silk cut Jaguar era. Um, Because I remember going and watching them when we weren't practicing. We went and watched them or get blast round. So I'm going to have to do, so I'll end, I'm going to have to end this here um, because (laughs) I don't think you can end on anything better than that. So I'm going to, if you've got footage of this, I'm looking at my camera now of this. I want to see it. That's the mint. I I can't compute what that must have been like. That because mu- I mean it was it was, it was obviously I was I don't know I've been then I don't know twenty twenty five something like that and uh, in qualifying I think I was about twenty third or something out of the sixty five or something so it was going pretty well for like basically privateers me and Keith were you know we just turned up with a caravan on the back of his van um, and we ended up through a lot of the fast ones blowing up and yeah. You know, I actually started on the second row. So I was behind like Leonard Bowl in world champion. I think Roger Goff, who was British champion, a British lad, and some other, some other foreign driver on the front. And then I was on like the second row, you know, having never been abroad before, you know, only done like sort of one year of supercarting really. You know, and you're sort of in front of a huge crowd. I mean, one hell of a buzz. Well, I, I don't know what to say about that. Other than that's that's one of the coolest things I've ever heard, and I didn't even really know about it. So I'll have to do some digging because that's you'll have to see if you can find some footage of it. Yeah. There must be some out there somewhere. Yeah, there must be. Someone's got something. I guess somewhere. Leonard Bowling. Uh, if you get onto Leonard Bowling's like uh, site, he might have some footage of it because mm. um, the sort of Swedes and the Danes and that were really into like video cameras in the early days. I mean, that's why the stuff from some of the stuff from Morecambe, you know, they were always quite keen on that. Well, we'll have to. I'll have to get on it. Well, thanks for coming on, Mark. I appreciate it, mate. Um, yeah, well, we appreciate all you do. Anyway, I mean, trying to publicise the thing—that's what it needs, isn't it? Yeah. So we probably all need to do a bit more of it, like you say. You know, we've I, got the tools, and then I, don't. Yeah, I think the. I think the. I think people, if they realised what they've got, um, and understood how cool what they do is, and that people would sit, would watch it, and would get involved. Um, we could we could have a really good year um but yeah i mean thanks for thanks for coming on mark and we'll have to do it again sometime after the summer's races we've got through it and some more stories to tell and i'll crack on do some research see if i can find this uh Hockenheim yeah thing. maybe we ought to look into some of the old tracks as well and see you know get a bit of history on those It'd be nice to sort of you know because i'm sure it would appeal to quite a lot of people like the morecambe thing did i was quite surprised how many people sort of came up to me uh God, it was marvelous. You know, what was it like there? And then some were there when they were there with the dads. The potential, the, I tell you what, if, if if we tell the stories um, and we dig them out, I think I think we've got a really good potential for like a cultural uh, renaissance, um, for want of a better term, in kart racing. So the potential's there. So um, thanks for coming on, Mark. We'll have to speak again soon. And um, yeah. Yeah, keep safe and see you soon.